Hello and welcome everybody to uh, our webinar on Achieving Innovation and Resilience for Financial Enterprises. This webinar is organized by DataArt in collaboration with Amazon Web Services. Big thank you to our colleagues at, uh, on the AWS team for their help in making this happen. I hope you enjoy the presentations and the discussions today. I think we're in for a treat because we have two genuinely interesting and uh, extremely knowledgeable uh, speakers with us today. Ralph Severini is a global lead for insurance partners at AWS. And Martin Ectris was the chief innovation officer at Legal in General. Ralph, Martin, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Hello. Nice, uh, nicely branded virtual backgrounds. Uh, I, uh, I, I picked something that didn't have our logo in it. I think it looks better. Uh, this is the park in the town where I live. So um, without further ado, before I, I uh, turn it over to uh, Ralph and Martin, I just wanna walk our audience very briefly through what to expect today. Our plan is very straightforward. Um, we will hear from Ralph and Martin. There's gonna be a conversation as we move through their uh, prepared remarks and talking points. Um, we are reserving some uh, time for question and answer session, dedicated question and answer session towards the end of our program today. You should see a button in your Zoom interface that allows you to type in your questions. So as those questions accumulate, when we move into Q&A, I will be reading those questions out loud so the rest of the audience can hear them. And Martin and, and uh, Ralph uh, will uh, give their answers to those questions. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so we'll make the recording available for on-demand viewing later for those of us who are registered but weren't able to uh, join for the live session. Um, also, we're gonna be running a couple of quick polls throughout the webinar, so I would uh, encourage you to uh, submit and share your questions when you see the poll, uh, or your answers rather, when you see the poll questions pop up. In fact, um, in fact, I think we're, we wanna do our first quick poll right now. As people are coming in, joining in, uh, let's bring up our first poll. Uh, please pick the answer that best characterizes, to, in your opinion, best characterizes the stage at which your company currently is with regards to the public cloud adoption journey. Whether it's just early discussions, explorations, and planning, or maybe you are moving into experimentations and prototypes and POCs, or you have active migrations in progress and you have some production workloads already in the public cloud, or you're all in and actively adopting uh, the public first stance, uh, cl cl uh, public cloud first stance. Let's see what the answers show. Give it a few seconds for people to submit their answers. Um, are we going to be able to see the results of the poll? Let's hope yes. I hope yes. Okay, the answers are coming in. Very good. There's more people joining. Over 50 people with us already. Uh, the poll is at 50%, and we're there. All right. Um, this is uh, this is an interesting, an interesting picture. More people are all in than I would have expected, and a diverse picture as well. Good. Uh, thank you very much for for your answers. All right. So with that, without further ado, I would just give it over to you, Ralph. Um, I gave a very brief introduction, uh, but maybe before you move into your remarks, if you could say a few more words about your professional journey and also your current role at AWS. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And uh, I, I, I guess you probably know where I answered that question. Uh, so thanks for inviting me. And really, it's an honor and pleasure to be representing AWS and in this webinar, a little bit about me, um, perhaps a little bit more. Yeah, I, I've been with AWS, uh, you know, it's closing in on a year now, a uh, lot of uh, number of years in the business, uh, currently based out of New York City, but I'm not there. I'm actually in Park City, Utah these days out of the, co the world of COVID, or at least the center of it. And my responsibilities are a really global strategy and business development for our worldwide insurance partner network, of which you are one, Peter, um, Data Art. And, I, and uh, my previous positions have been in a lot of technology companies, um, as well as in the insurance industry. I've been an underwriter. Uh, I've spent time in uh, some high loss claims and I've been a broker. So I've kind of run the gamut between all those pieces and I kind of consider myself a hybrid after all these years. So um, that's me. Um, 
and then you know what I what I was thinking about and you know in this in this webinar and topic you know I had a lot of thoughts on the alignment of IT and uh, simultaneously creating innovation you know all while while maintaining the resilience of the business and you know it's certainly not a mission for the faint hearted and really is a mission that maybe only the best CEOs and their exec staffs have consistently achieved so as I was thinking about this, and I thought maybe one approach for me is to share some thoughts from some of the world's top execs on these topics that either I knew personally or met. Uh, you know, keep in mind, um, Peter, that uh, and, and Martin, that this requires me to show my gray hair around these topics, but we, we were joking about that before. But, uh, but I hope it weaves together some stories around information, innovation, and leadership, and maybe something about who Amazon is. So um, let me tackle IT first. Um, one of the first thought leaders of IT that I've worked with is Paul Straussman. Um, he's written at least five books and was labeled uh, one of the CIOs of the decade by CIO Magazine. I got to know him, I got to know uh, Paul personally and attended one of his CIO what he calls week-long boot camps for new CIOs. So interestingly, the first thing he says to the new CIOs, uh, and as I recall, was don't get too comfortable because your average uh, in-chair tenure is 26 months. You know, so maybe that doesn't hold so true in 2020, but, it, but his point was clear, you know, you've got to deliver business results. Um, the next thing he asked the group um, during that opening session was, do you know who the CIO reports to in the most successful companies in the country? And, you know, most of us all raised our hand and said, oh, yeah, it's um, the CEO, because that's where we all wanted to be, so to speak. So um, but he told them that it was the CFO based upon his his analysis. And well, I'm not going to get into that. You can read his book, so to speak. But it's it's and, and it's not so important that these whole these statements hold true in 2020 or even then. Um, but they held some axioms for me first. Um, you know, maybe that the CIO position, as we kind of know, um, is somewhat of a merry-go-round. And, um, you know, you have to make your mark with innovation early on, or you're not going to have that chance later. So that's a piece of it. The second point that he made so well, um, that it's not so important to whom you report to, as much as you must be able to know the business beyond pure technology. So you definitely need to know your key business numbers that's driving your business. You know, what are your loss ratios? Um, what are your total expense ratios? How does that factor into the types of business that you can support and grow with? So one of the underlying points here is that too often CIOs and IT are considered a cost and uh, support center rather than a growth or profit center. And I think that still needs to evolve today. And as I said, some of uh, Paul's precepts don't hold up really well in 2020, but two of his many points stood kind of the test of time for me. And uh, at Amazon, we have these 14 leadership principles by which we drive our company, um, which some of you may have heard about. But um, I think Paul Straussman, uh, I think of him as our Amazon principle of take ownership of results. So... Um, a second story I thought I'd relate was I had the chance and honor to meet uh, and talk to Jack Welsh, um, arguably one of the top CEOs of all time. Jack had just retired from General Electric and he was keynote at a banking conference along with, if anybody remembers, Ben Bernanke, who is at the time Fed chairman. So it was a battle of the heavyweight, so to speak. Uh, one is... One of my friends knew Jack's wife, uh, Susie, who was a journalist at the time. And this was Jack's second wife. And um, I didn't know either one of them, but he was there at the conference. And my fr friend says, would you like to meet Jack and Susie? So uh, Jack is signing autographs at the time in his new book. I think it was Winning or Winning Strategies. And I got personally introduced. But I, uh, I didn't ask Jack to sign the book right away. I, I did ask him how his golf game was. Um, especially now that he'd gone into retirement. And for those that don't know it, Jack was arguably the number one CEO golfer in the country, maybe the world. Um, so this got him talking to me, and I finally got to ask him my one thing. Um, and I said, you know, what advice would you give me if I were running a company, Jack? And, you know, he he didn't have 
he didn't spend too much time thinking about it, but he said, hey, one, one piece of advice to you, Ralph, is to take a chance and continue to take chances in your career and with your business. And he said, you won't be right all the time, but, you know, um, and then he went on to tell me that he acquired some several hundred companies in his career, but was right more than more often than not, like 60%. And I think he did like 500 companies. But the payoff for him was learning, um, as he said, from losers. Um, moving on and taking a chance. So, you know, I kind of thought about that for the past decade and kind of doubled down on my notion of how it pays off for innovation and new product development. And Jack was a master at new product development at GE, and he was a master at things like quality and bringing that into the GE fold. Um, and I think some of this is finally coming to bear fruit in the in insurance industry. And so if you work at Amazon, and I'm relating this back to another important leadership principle for us, and that's being leaders are right a lot. And I think Jack would have been a really terrific Amazonian. And by the way, for those that, who don't know, Jack passed away a couple of, a few months ago on March 1st, really one of our great, one of the great CEOs of the world. Um, you know, this last quick story I'll just quickly recount is I f that I found worthy of being relevant is about a presentation I made a, um, about the same time, about a decade ago, to a group of financial services execs at the Harvard Club in Boston. And these were execs really across all the financial services, capital markets, banking, and insurance. Um, the big difference here was my co-presenter was Professor Michael Porter of the Harvard Business School. I say my co-presenter, I was his co-presenter. But um, anybody who studied business in undergrad or did your MBA, you probably let, read at least one of Michael's books. He invented the five forces, um, you know, the competitive forces. He invented the value chain and has been turned, uh, I guess, one of the top business minds over the past couple of decades. Um, by the way, this was the most nerve, nervous I've ever, nerve wracked I have ever been in delivering a presentation, not because of the audience, but because of Michael. Um, so he delivered our, this joint, our joint topic centered around information innovation. Mind you, mind you that this audience had some seriously smart people in financial services, but it was Michael's premise, and you can go back to some of the Harvard Business Reviews um, back during that period, and he was, he was really talking about driving information insights into the hands of your organization. And that was really crucial to success. Um, not just providing in, insights to the executive team, but to middle level managers and line personnel so they could be responsible for change. And it was IT's responsibility to develop the systems and mine the data to get at those in, in, insights, share them appropriately, and then act on them. Um, I mean, he really emphasized to me and everyone else uh, during this uh, presentation that the value of innovation is in the information. And I think today we really have those tools at hand like AI and ML. Um, certainly now more than a decade ago, and you can start lifting the insights from, you know, out of your data lakes, and that can keep you, keep your company viable for years to come and alive as a, and alive as a business. And, at, and, and to wrap this up, and at, at AWS, we call this leadership by which we run our business diving deep, um, you know, which is this relentless drive to analyze all the details. So um, with that, uh, those were kind of my three little vignettes, stories. Peter, I'll turn this back to, I guess, the first, uh, um, oh, the second poll, and over to you. Thank you, thank you, Ralph. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned those books, and especially the fact that a uh, sizable proportion of the CIOs report into CFOs, what came to my mind is actually books by your fellow Amazonian, Mark Schwartz, uh, on the role of the technology leader in the current sort of uh, corporate and enterprise environment. I don't know, Martin, if you're familiar, I found them very insightful. Um, one is called The Seat at the Table and the other, I forget the, the full title, but it has the words war and peace in it. Uh, it's an extremely fascinating book. I find it both humorous and, 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 and very insightful at the same time. I would highly recommend. That's a, that's, that's a good turn on, Peter. Thank you. Um, very well. Uh, let, okay, let's run our second quick poll here. So uh, what we wanted to ask you guys is, um, 
in your company, to the best of your knowledge, what would be the core, in your understanding, the core driver behind the move towards public cloud? Um, you're only able to pick one sort of uh, one dominant motivation. Is it cost savings first and foremost? Is it things like staff productivity, as in your IT folks are able to uh, more efficiently manage, you know, greater amount of virtual machines or uh, a higher number of terabytes per single admin or something like that? metrics of that nature? Or is it operational resiliency, meaning, you know, public cloud infrastructure is extremely resilient, but great uptime numbers, incident counts going down, MTTR going down, things of that nature? Or is it uh, more business agility, the ability to accelerate your time to market, uh, accelerate the pace of your software releases, um, et cetera, et cetera. So please speak one. Answers are coming in. It's going to be a few more seconds. Yep. Almost half is done. And the results should be coming up shortly. Okay. Almost there. Okay. Let's see what we have. Nice. All right. Uh, yeah, this sort of reflects the journey that people uh, often find themselves on. You, you come for the cost savings, you end up staying because of business agility. I always say when, whenever we're speaking with customers about the motivations or reasons to adopt public cloud, it's really not about cost savings. Uh, what would be the point of doing the same thing you were doing yesterday, but cheaper? I mean, it's better than nothing, I guess, but it's what public cloud enables is the ability to do things you would never be able to do on-prem. Um, simply because of how cloud operates. Very good. Uh, insightful answer. Thank you very much for sharing your answers. With that, Martin, uh, over to you. Um, you and I first had uh, our first conversation a few years ago. I, I, I hesitate to say four years ago or five when you were still at Canonical, right? Um, yes. So same. Uh, if you could share with our audience a little bit more detail about your professional journey and uh, your role at uh, Legal General. It's not a, a super common title, Chief Innovation Officer. Yes, so, so let me go back about like 10, 11 years, uh, which is when I started with cloud. So uh, I was back then at Nokia Siemens Networks and we did uh, startups at NSN and the whole thing was, what could we do with cloud computing um, and telecom? And this were the times that like Amazon had two services, which were like S3 and EC2. So uh, they've grown a little bit since back then. Um, I'm, I'm always surprised when I open the console to see how many servers there are now. Uh, but uh, it was interesting to, to see those early days of cloud where like you couldn't even um, store the image. And if you, if you reboot the server, things would have to be reinstalled almost. Um, but that was really interesting to see those first days of the cloud. And, and afterwards, I changed to a company that was 75% of what was running on the cloud. And, and I met, um, because I was doing cloud strategy back then, I met my predecessor, uh, a person called Simon Wortley, who was a, an interesting person because he made this Wortley map, which is about predicting the future. Can you actually predict the future? Can you impact it in such a way that like you have a sort of chessboard in front of you and you see all the chess pieces, but your opponents that don't have a map are blind. And, and he does some really interesting um, YouTube videos about uh, how you have uh, the Wortley map and how you can predict the future and how uh, that is... Um, when it gets closer to the customer, it's more important. Uh, but when the further it goes away, 
um, the more commodity it becomes. And this is exactly where Amazon played very well because Amazon pushed compute from something that was valuable that you bought as, as a box from like a, a, a server vendor to something that like you didn't care to, to, to name your servers anymore. Back then, every server had their name. They were like cuddled, they were like unique. Whereas now it's like cattle, get me some more. We that's, don't even- That's versus cattle, that's right. <laughs> exactly, we don't even have uh, servers anymore. We're going completely serverless. So, so that was interesting to see how that future played out and how if you are early on, you can actually completely change industries. And we've seen in the last 10 years, how like the Netflix is that built on top of cloud, uh, a distribution network have, have like completely changed their industry. We're seeing that every day in more and more industries, every, uh, software is eating the world at a faster pace. So, so after Nokia, I, I joined Canonical, which, um, and had uh, their Ubuntu platform as, as the cloud operating system because they were the earliest to work with all the startups uh, in Silicon Valley that just explored the cloud. We did a lot of IoT as well, uh, AI and so on. I, I afterwards set up the IoT business there, uh, worked with the team again in, in Amazon around uh, Greengrass, uh, which is um, a cloud on the edge and, and Internet of Things. And then um, I, I grew a little bit tired of like high tech innovation because we would be working with the Amazons, the Facebooks and, and others solving all these like extremely challenging problems. Uh, but there would be like 5 million solutions for one paying customer problem because not everybody has a billion plus customers that need something. Uh, it's, it's only very few people in the world that have those type of problems. So I decided let's change industry and let's go to an industry where I find 5 million paying customer problems and let's see what could possibly uh, come out uh, by bringing some of the innovations uh, in there. So that's when I joined uh, in 2017, about uh, three years ago. Um, legal in general as chief uh, digital officer for their general insurance. And the first thing I did is I, I set up something similar to what we did uh, 10 years ago, um, which was a beta program. So we focused very much how to bring uh, the cost of failure down because we couldn't guarantee an innovation that things work out. So focus on like, if it doesn't work, fail fast and cheap, because that's the only thing that innovation can really optimize. If you can guarantee success, you're doing evolution, you're not doing revolution. So, so the other thing that, that I learned back then as well is, what should we focus on if like people around you don't speak the same language? So my, my, my first thing was everybody was introducing me, this is Martin, he speaks another language. And I was like, yes, I speak five languages, but I hope you can understand my English. I was using this one word that nobody understood in the audience and the word was API. So API is just like a language for computers. Like how do you speak to a computer? Well, if you don't speak the same language, uh, then they don't understand you. If you don't have an API that is compatible with their API, you can't talk to the computer. So because they didn't understand the power of APIs and, and Amazon's um, cloud is all about APIs, it was hard to explain to people. So I said like, I need to make it simpler. How can I make it that people that have no clue about technology understand? So I came up with the idea of Harry Potter problem. If you tell me your Harry Potter problem, I might be able to help you. And I started to wear red trousers because like they couldn't spell my name correctly, but there was only one in an insurance company of 185 years old that had red trousers on. So who's the guy with the red trousers? They would always find me. And people would go like, what is he talking about? Why? Harry Potter problem. What is this? So, so basically, a Harry Potter problem is very easy. If you have a business problem, it's normally of two types. The one that money and time can solve. Let's not focus on those. Let's get the digital teams, the change teams, the IT teams focusing on, on those. But there's another category of critical business problems that like you might have tried several times or you don't even know where to start. 
And the only thing you can now wish for is an innovator with a magic wand to make it go away. Hence, it's a Harry Potter problem because you need that innovator with a magic wand. So once people understood that, they started bringing those Harry Potter problems. And one of our Harry Potter problems was in household claims, how do you make it super easy for honest customers to claim, hey, my television fell off the wall. It was an accident. I would like to get my money back to buy a new television. And how do you make it super difficult for the dishonest customers it's actually a 25-inch television, but football season is coming up. Let's call it a 60-inch. Get a fake invoice from a mate and put in that I actually had a 60-inch television. So this is where we first used uh, serverless to come up with something called smart claim, which like we used all type of digital uh, technologies as well as um, uh, some uh, cutting-edge academical uh, psychological behavior to then basically make it a customers that really uh, were honest, here's a voucher, go and buy yourself a new television. And others that like had this fake 60 inch television lying on the floor had a lot more problems to prove that they actually had one in their possession and, and strangely always um, pushed the button of like, I want to withdraw my claim before they actually got through the whole process. So, and that's the power of technology. You can really change things. And, and, and the fact that that claim process went from a negative net promoter score to 90, which was the highest um, in the industry. It won the award for best claim technology of the year. Uh, and it had a, a, a financial impact because all of a sudden, yes, we, we gladly pay honest customers that have a valid claim, uh, but uh, paying the, the dishonest customers actually is bad for the honest customers because now they have to pay more premium to cover all those fake claims. So, so it was really a, a big impact. And that got me then promoted to chief innovation officer. And that's hey, where I then went around and asked for more Harry Potter problems. I was just going to ask you, um, were you was, uh, was, Ellen, was legal in general able to um, raise prices, so to speak? Because I know a couple of insurers that have actually used that positive net promoter score to keep their, to keep their actual prices high. Now, I wouldn't say that's where you guys were going, but, um, you know, that, that, that customer retention is so important. So um, that's a great point. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of that J.D. JD Edwards study on, um, you know, who does, you know, who does claims uh, best. So um, be interested in your thoughts around um, a little bit more about that would be great. Yeah. So, so. So, so, so the type of problems I now focus more my time on are more related to pensions, retirement. Uh, also, uh, there's a lot of like capital. Uh, um, so, we, so we're the big, biggest investment manager. We, we have uh, a very active householding, household and house um, ecosystem. So it's more those things I focus on. I focus less on, on, on our uh, household claims. Uh, because um, they're no longer part of, of, of the bigger legal in general, uh, because it's a very commoditized market, as you said, with the prices going down, uh, the, the margins also go down, even if you uh, can optimize uh, other parts of the business. So, so another thing that data art um, was also very much uh, involved in uh, is, is um, Bermuda business, we have a, a reinsurance business for pension risk transfer. And um, pension risk transfer is basically if you have, um, let's say, 10,000 people that like are retired, uh, you need to pay them every month until at a certain moment um, they unfortunately pass away. Now, if uh, they pass away, um, slower than uh, predicted, you don't get more money. So you have a, a risk that like you are on the hook of paying while uh, basically uh, you don't have more money coming in. Mm -hmm. so, uh, companies tend to reinsure this. Now, the problem with this whole process is that um, it tends to be a magical spreadsheet. 
that moves around every month. Every month it would be, I do my calculations and, do you, and you do your calculations. If I make a mistake, uh, it's probably in my favor. If you make a mistake, it's in your favor. And those type of things then become very hard because nobody wants to trust the other people's spreadsheet. So, so we now have a, a Bermuda business that like is in a great place for sun, but not for hiring people. Because all of a sudden, um, you can't go and hire a thousand people in Bermuda that are actuaries that have like experience because they're just not there. And flying them over from New York or London is, is like very expensive. So they came to us, how can we scale our reinsurance business without throwing people at it? That was the, the next Harry Potter problem. And uh, this is where um, the data art team and ourselves, we work together because uh, um, we looked into smart ledgers and, and distributed ledgers and smart contracts. And like, is it possible that instead of every month having to discuss about like several weeks before we can uh, agree on that number on that spreadsheet, that we just put all the claims on um, the blockchain and all the smart contracts now minutes later tell us how much money we owe and next month comes and they do it again. So we bring down that like um, reconciliation time from weeks to minutes. And that's exactly what we did. We launched that last year. We are now, and this is public knowledge, working with Amazon on uh, the managed blockchain, uh, as well as with data art to now scale this up and, and make this possible at a larger scale. So that's uh, a second um, Harry Potter problem. And I can talk about more later on. But back to you, Peter. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit to? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm sure you've worked with numbers of you numbers of partners over the years. So, I I think in one of our early conversations, you referred to the importance of having the right network or ecosystem of partners around you to support you in, in these initiatives. One of the um, uh, motifs, so to speak, that we run into every now and again when we work with customers to help them with their Harry Potter problems or, you know, uh, less magical problems, maybe more mundane problems, is that um, it's not only, it, 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 how do I put it? It's, it's a combination of several things uh, that are missing or uh, lacking in the situation. It's either lack of being able to move at speed, the deadlines are very aggressive, and there's simply not enough people like in your Bermuda example, there's simply not enough people. It's very hard to scale up or scale up quickly enough. That's one need that you have. And so you, you, you kind of find yourself having to reach out and engage other organizations to, to scale you up in that sense, give you more capacity, if you will, and enable you to move in speed. The other is lack of expertise. So for an organization that has never had a need to use a particular technology, to become suddenly experts in it is not possible. So you have to rely on some expertise that needs to come from outside to skill your teams up, right? Can you speak to your experience working with partners in solving those particular challenges and maybe some others that I'm not mentioning? Yeah, so uh, if I want to be inundated with like um, a consultancy company saying they want to do something, uh, I, I just have to go on LinkedIn and say like, can somebody, tell me how this is done. Can you basically give me uh, some day rate or whatever? Like th there's many, many partners. The, the, like the problem is not finding partners. On, on LinkedIn, it has become too easy to be inundated. I literally get every day uh, people saying, hey, I can help you with uh, AI or blockchain or whatever. Um, so, so how do you select the best ones? And we did a five-minute RFI, which uh, for those not uh, familiar in large companies, you normally do a request for information first to find out like what you don't know you didn't know. And then often you do a, an RFP request for proposal to, um, to go in and then contract with uh, the best partner. Now, I've always been traditionally against those processes because, especially in software, uh, they tend to become tick box exercises. Do you have this feature? Do you support this standard? Uh, can your software do this, 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 this? And the list becomes longer and longer and longer. And with software, you have a perverse effect. The more lines of code, the more features, the worse everything becomes. 
it becomes very hard now to train people on it, very difficult to use, very difficult to scale, very difficult to secure, to operate, and so on. So you do not want that. So, so the, the whole process of like getting enterprise software where you look at features, I think is wrong. So we tried some new process, which was this five-minute RFI. And this was where like, what if we just tell people our Harry Potter problem? And we asked them in five minutes to present a solution. And we go to the business and we give all these uh, solutions and then we'll see what the business wants to do. So in five minutes, we don't necessarily select a partner, but we can unselect partners. And strangely, we unselected some very, very famous consultancies in that first five-minute RFI. Wait, quick, quick, quick clarification. Did you give people five minutes to come up with an answer or do you give them five minutes to present their answer? <laughs> so let me, let me explain what a five-minute RFI is because it's a very simple thing. It's basically three slides and a video. The first slide talks about, okay, so this is our Harry Potter problem. How would you solve it? The second, how much would it cost to solve? And the third one, technology-wise, can you like explain a little bit how it works? And those will be the typical things that you do in a, any of those things. But the innovative part is the video. In the next minutes, and literally one to three minutes, can you show us how easy your solution would solve our problem? And this is where it often goes wrong because like making an easy solution for a complex problem is really, really, really hard. Uh, and and we, we asked a lot of companies to come up with like the solution. Uh, we already said it. We want a blockchain solution for this um, uh, Bermuda problem, but what would it look like? Uh, but we got back two really, really great videos, uh, and, and one of the companies is here present. And that's how we started our relationship, uh, by allowing the teams actually to prove how they would solve it and do that in minutes. They got a week to do it. So, so the, the whole process takes a little bit longer than five minutes. But from a business person, just seeing a video, they get this like um, iPhone moment where yeah. you, they go like, that's easy. That's what I want. Faster horse with like some fireworks bolted onto it. That's not a Tesla. Um, so, so that's the, the exact thing that you want. Uh, and then afterwards, it was an hour of each uh, explaining more in depth. And we took a decision. And that's what it should be take something and then what we then tend to do is we do a beta. So in the alpha phase, you gave the Harry Potter problem and we can do a five minute RFI to go and say like, hmm, this could be a, a solution. Now it's great to have a video if your horse is too slow about a Tesla out racing a horse, but did they fake the video? Is it real? Mm -hmm. what, what should we be believing of this? So that's why we do a four to six week beta. And basically, it's money that like is a rounding error for most projects that we are willing to lose. Can you, in four to six weeks, demonstrate that there's actually something like an electric car that can outrace a horse? Now, in, in six weeks' time, you don't have the time to design a whole car. So what you tend to do is to basically four wheels, an electric, and a garden chair all put them together on a straight line and you can now prove with a battery that like it can during 30 seconds outrace the fastest horse. You've proven that like that there is a solution, but you also use those six weeks to come up with the other problems now. Okay, this thing doesn't eat grass, doesn't drink water. What does it need? Where do I get it? It doesn't really work very well on, on bubbly things. So we might need to think about suspensions and about roads and how do we do that? So is there a business case now for it? And so on. So in those betas, we basically get to what we call a dragon's den. And for the American viewers, uh, it's a shark tank where we invite our sponsors to sit and watch a presentation about like, this is how we solved your Harry Potter problem. We now need some money to do a pilot. Mm -hmm. 
And then during the next three months, we get some more money and we now have to prove that this market fit, that like basically it works, uh, customers like it. In the case of uh, Bermuda, we, we showed it to customers and a potential customer. And at the end of the pilot, that potential customer decided to give Bermuda the biggest contract in their history. Oh, wow. uh, so, so that's the, the type of like uh, things that you want to get to. You get real validation uh, of customers that they like it, because then you go into the last phase, phase, which is like you now scale it up. You launch it and scale it up. Uh, where in, in in the pilot, you'd build one electric vehicle and you try to get ten thousand people to pre-order it. If you get that, you've market fit. In the last phase, you would build factories now to make 20,000 or 50,000 cars. So in the last phase, which is normally expensive one, you now do have the budget to go and do things at scale. But by going through that very well-defined process, what we are able to do is we can compete with other things you can normally not. In innovation, it's very hard to go to any board and say like, hmm, We'd like to have a million or two or three and do this project where we probably are going to fail. We don't know if there's customer demand, but can you please give it? And like two minutes before, there was a team that probably said, oh, there's this regulatory change. If we don't get the three million, then we are out of business. Or this is big customer is about to walk away and to, unless we get three million to add this feature. Or we did uh, this nice profit loss statement with business case around like the possibility to add this and this with a market study. And we think that like we have a, an ROI um, that is positive and we get uh, so many percentage um, uh, back if, if we do this investment today in the next five years. And then you come. And you say, no idea. I only know that my cost will probably be this, not even sure. And I'm not sure that we're going to get anywhere. So that's how we go away from like that part to make innovation investable. Because once you get to the pilot, you've proven that there's extra business demand. You've proven the technology works. Then businesses and boards become more interested in giving you money. You sound like a venture capital player. You're, you know, you should be running a private equity company here at this point. Well, it, it's in not a sense, that, you are. It, you know? it, it, it's exactly that model. So basically, our team is called Future Ventures. It's not called Innovation because what we're trying to do is create ventures that generate money in the future, and we consider our internal sponsors VCs. So, so we go through all these round seed funding, round A, round B, round C, and so on, just like a VC would do, but we do it inside the company. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and I think, I, I think that's a model that really works well now for insure techs as well, because you've got all these uh, new companies, and if you flip this out to the you know private equity market and the venture capital market, in a sense, they're looking at the same thing. At the sense, you're looking at, you're, you, you know, they might be delivering you that one minute, three minute video with three PowerPoint slides or something like that. So um, what an interesting way to approach things. Um, uh, that's really cool, Mark. Yeah. So, and, and, uh, and in the betas, we also all often involve new partners with new functionality to see if it works. So, so it also opens the door to, to work with companies that traditionally we wouldn't work with. Yeah. So, so, so if you would go with a standard RFP, you'd go to the normal ones. You'd go to the Gardner Magic Quadrant and so on. But how can you change and 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 revolutionize an industry if you take the same partners and the same software solutions that everybody used last year? If you expect next year to be different by doing the same as last year. Definition is not intelligence that would come to mind. Yeah, yeah, and and um, you know, with that, I mean, I spent some time in IT um, in my earlier days, and you know, at, at that point, you probably shook up a, a, a few seats with your red pants and your red trousers, and uh, you know, um, your the approach to things, so to speak, and how to measure what you want to bring in. And did by, by the way, did you did you, you did you have any guardrails around? you know, your approach to, you know, experimentation and innovation? 
Yeah, so, so that's the interesting thing. So the beta is basically, and, and, and this is where like we said, okay, we have six weeks. We want to hire some new partners and new software we've never worked with. And, and the first thing would be support uh, functions like our procurement team would go like, hmm, Martin, we have a problem. It takes us six weeks to bring in a contractor. How are you going to like bring in somebody tomorrow make them work for four to six weeks. If we take six weeks in our traditional process to do background checks and to get them on an approved supplier list and so on and so on. So we started working with all those support functions on like, how can we solve that? What can we do that in a regulated industry, you can still be trying these new things without really endangering anything. So a beta has very, very simple rules. No production data no integrations into any real systems, no customer data, nothing like that. Because you can prove a lot of things without having any of those. And all of a sudden, if, if it's just something that like you're doing on a private uh, test without really, if it gets hacked, exposing anything, all of a sudden the, the compliance requirements, the procurement requirements can all be relaxed. That doesn't mean that when you then go to a pilot and when you can go and launch it, that they don't have to be applied. You just have more time to gradually make um, those things happen. Uh, and basically in that process, for instance, um, uh, data art went from a, a beta participant to uh, a validated uh, supplier that's now being used by multiple business units. So that's also allowing you to do things. I just noticed there's a, a question from Cliff, which is really interesting. So our new technology is a double-edged sword for the legal and general business in that cloud and digitalization are lowering the barriers to entry and thus driving commoditization. So, so I, I, I think uh, commoditization will happen. This is where like uh, the Wortley maps or the value chain maps are about everything goes towards commoditization. It starts off like with some like new technology nobody knows. It then becomes something only consultants can do. Then it becomes a product and then it becomes a commodity. Whatever you do, technology tends to follow that path. So, so if you now start using cloud and so on, do you lower the barriers of entry for the rest? Well, actually, if you don't use it, they probably will make you irrelevant first uh, and you will not be able to catch up. So you'd better be using it because technology is lowering the barriers to your industry anyway. It, it hasn't got anything to do with like you doing it or not. What you can do, however, is use technology to allow partners to come and help you to build ecosystems. So that's the third um, Harry Potter problem we're currently uh, launching a solution for. It's like, how do you make something traditionally boring that you'd use once a year exciting for customers? So we, we got our, um, our team uh, in Workplace Pension coming to us and say, like, we're starting to lose RFPs and me not being happy with RFPs, uh, that got my attention because they didn't have a mobile app for a pension. And we go like, well, can't we build a mobile app? Of course we can build a mobile app. It's easy to build a mobile app for pension. But we asked the same employees of the same companies that say like, where's your mobile app for pension mm -hmm. if their employees would be using it? And they would say, no. Why would I use a mobile app to see my pension? I can log into any website. I do that once a year, look at my pension, I'm done. I don't need a mobile app to take up space in, 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 a, in my phone, which is already running low on space, and an app that I use once a year, which I forgot the password for seven months later, and then I spend five minutes resetting it. So how can you solve that? So that is um, our, our latest uh, collaboration with both Amazon and, and Data Art, of which we're now uh, launching uh, externally. And, and it's all about, is it unique that um, you have a, a rather boring, but really, really, really important once a year service? And, and we found out actually the world is full of those. If you think about personally, how many times 
do you have to go into some service where like once a year, it's really important for the next five minutes and then afterwards it's over with. A household claim we talked about, hey, if your mm -hmm. television fell off the wall, it's really important now. The rest of the, the year, you wouldn't care less. Your car insurance, but take a step further. Non-financial services related products, hey, my water meter uh, is broken. How do I get that replaced. Uh, I have, um, I, uh, my gas bill is too high. Uh, my council tax, uh, this, this subscription I have from, uh, for, for annually going there or whatever. All these things are things you do once, twice, at most once a month. You don't want an app for that. You'd actually want an app that eats all of them together and, and makes it easy for that day that you want them to find them. And that's exactly the type of thing that, that we're doing. Make it super simple to, to have 300 things you do once a year, and now you open the app every day to do a different thing. Hey, Martin, um, uh, how is that translated? So, I mean, I was, I, I, having spent time in IT, sometimes, you know, how do you turn that IT organization through this transformation that you've created into that growth and profit center for legal in general. How is that, has that translated? You mentioned one thing on, you know, improved claims experience, net promoter scores increasing. Um, how, how have you connected this to the, to the customer side of things, so to speak? Yeah, so, so for instance, this last um, Harry Potter problem we showed to potential customers and, and existing customers, and all of a sudden, again, uh, our workplace pensions started signing up uh, some of their biggest contracts. Uh, there's, there's, um, well, I can't mention names here, but uh, there were some very, very interesting companies who, who signed up very recently, um, and, and several of them were on our innovation day. Uh, so, so if you can make that link, all of a sudden it becomes really, really interesting and, and the business wants more innovation. And that's why our uh, workplace pension team won um, the, the tech leader of the year award this year. Uh, so so they, they come now a lot more with Harry Potter problems and how can we solve it? <laughs> so, so that's the, the thing where you need to collaborate. And then with, procurement and with like HR and with all these others, uh, you actually share the same problem with them. As an innovation team, it's like, I don't have a lot of funding. How can we solve that? Well, an HR team and a procurement team don't have a lot of funding either because if you have an extra million to spend, are you going to spend that on them or on a sales team or on a development team that can like launch a new product? Uh, you probably are not going to um, spend on support team. So that's why we work together with those teams and say like, what if we could like go from IT being a cost, procurement being a cost, HR being a cost to make it into a revenue stream. And that's the latest uh, things that we're working on. Like, can we do that? And I'll, hopefully next year's uh, seminar, I can show you how we did it. Yeah, haven't been in the insurance business. Um, you know, it tends to be a little bit slow. Although we're, I think we're in the fastest environment ever over the past two and a half decades that I've experienced this. Um, you must have a very for forward-looking, innovative-minded CEO and CIO. I'm assuming so. Um, I'd love to hear more of your experience. I know we don't have much more time, and I'm asking you questions. Peter, do we have any more questions um, that need to be answered from um, the outside, so to speak? Uh, um, we're, more questions may come in any minute. I had one question that I, I, I was really hoping, Martin, that you could spend maybe a minute or two on. You said innovation team. In that, uh, in that formulation lies a potential danger that I'm sure you recognize, that meaning innovation is the remit of the innovation team, but not for the rest of us. So I know that's not the case at LNG. Can you share with us how, wh whether you've run into that sort of problem and how you tackle that? Yeah, that's why we don't call it innovation team. We're the future ventures team. Right. <laughs> and, and that's why we, we're now trying to like, um, have others copy our alpha beta pilot approach. So, so and, and even outside. Look, if you are a great company that comes up with like a great way of solving our Harry Potter problem and you went through beta and pilot, or you, you need a pilot customer, but it's one of our big Harry Potter problems, 
send us a, a three minute video. I'm never too few time uh, to go and say like, this is the Harry Potter problem. Do you share it? Yes. Click here, play. Uh, I, that's the type of thing that like, uh, we want others to use because, um, the world is changing. It's no longer your existing competitor is your worst competitor. You, right. you, you might be in an industry like uh, telecom and all of a sudden a space company starts shooting up satellites and has this new technology to, to link up rural areas that like you with fiber cannot connect to. All of a sudden your biggest competitor that can also be, hey, strangely having self-driven cars that 5G was going to power, can now talk to, to satellites. All of a sudden, industries change. And the only way traditional companies can uh, go about is by partnering, by creating ecosystems, by working with the best technology companies, the, the best platform companies, the, uh, and so on. That's how you uh, innovate. And, and that's not up to the um, innovation team, it's to everybody. Because the last thing we want is that in Silicon Valley, all innovation is done and we're just here in the rest of the world, uh, uh, the, their product. That's, that cannot be the future. We need to create new jobs, new important jobs, um, and, and take away the boring things that we suffer a lot as a customer, but also as employees, and substitute it by a lot more interesting things, both for our customers and our employees. Well, you're going to attract more people to your line of thinking, from certainly from technologists in IT, because insurance has suffered in a, in, in a number of different areas. From for one, the, the aging of the workforce um, within within not uh, being an ex underwriter. That's that's one of the certainly one of the areas that's aging quickly, and that knowledge has to be captured by the insurers. Brokers are now the average age, I think, are 59. So how do you replace these people? How do you extract their knowledge? And how do you invigorate the IT organizations? Because you're competing against not only cap markets and banking, but the other industries out there for good, good technologists, so to speak. So um, Martin, I'd sign up with you any day. Uh, <laughs> I just want to tie, tie it back into uh, what's in the title of the webinar, and that's resiliency. We didn't touch upon it uh, explicitly, but I think it's it's uh, very evident from everything that has been shared today that uh, resiliency is about the uh, ability to respond to unforeseen events, among other things. And so it's the it's the innovator's mindset that also gives you the agility, uh, the basis for agility in how you do your business, including your technology and the rest of your business processes. And without that. Um, you're either going to be uh, disrupted by a competitor or you may be disrupted by an unforeseen event. I mean, we're living through one of such events right now as we speak. Obviously, nobody knows what the future holds. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? But it's uh, uh, this what seems what may seem like cannibalizing yourself and sort of uh, um, innovate to disrupt your own existing revenue streams even. But like Martin said, I, I think I, you know, I, I have to agree with you fully. Somebody's going to do it and better be you. Yeah, so your next okay. competitor is doing something in a garage that will make you irrelevant. So assume that. Now, what are you going to do? If, if your product... Make yourself irrelevant first. <laughs> yeah, if your product used to be uh, having like 50 years of, of positive profit and now it's reduced to five years. And, and in some gaming industries, it's even like five days. Uh, you need to focus on very quickly being able to come up with new revenue streams. So you need to have this whole funnel of new things coming very quickly. Otherwise, uh, you have a problem. So, so I see companies that need to be working at three speeds. Speed one keeps the lights on, current uh, cash cow and so on. Speed two is about let's have new digital solutions, let's improve. And speed three is like let's come up with a new thing because... Otherwise, uh, everything else will become irrelevant soon. If we don't have new revenues in the future, what are we going to do? Uh, Martin, uh, Ralph, we're up on time. I know Ralph had to jump off early. I uh, appreciate your time so much. Thanks, everyone who joined. Prasad, we see your question. I will forward your question to Martin, and hopefully we can get an answer by email if that's okay with you, Martin. There's another question yes. from the audience that we didn't get, have time to get to. 
Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, our colleagues at AWS for helping us organize the uh, the webinar. Thank you, Martin and Ralph, for agreeing to be our speakers today. I enjoyed the discussion. I hope you did too. We'll see you uh, at, at uh, our, our next events. We will be doing a, a technical event, a deeper dive on uh, Amazon Managed Blockchain A and B service. Um, that's going to be in a few weeks, perhaps maybe a month or and a half, two months from now. If you're interested in that event or anything else, really, uh, um, any aspect of your uh, innovation journey or your uh, cloud journey, um, feel free to reach out to us at aws uh, at datar.com. The email address that you see on the screen. We'll be happy to speak with you. Thank you, everybody, once again. We'll see you soon.